Bramley Hedge is on the other side of the stream, across the field. If you can find it, and if you look very hard amongst the tangled roots and stems, you may even see a wisp of smoke from a small chimney, or through an open door, a steep flight of stairs deep within the trunk of a tree. For this is the home of the mice of Bramley Hedge. Bramley Hedge by Jill Barclum. The Secret Staircase. It was a frosty morning. The air was crisp and cold, and everything sparkled in the winter sunshine. The little mice hurrying along the path turned up their collars and blew on their paws in an effort to keep warm. Merry midwinter! Panted Dusty Dogwood, scurrying past Mr. Apple and the Toad Flax children with a huge covered basket. Mr. Apple and the children were busy too, dragging great sprays of holly and trails of ivy and mistletoe towards the old oak palace. When they arrived at the gates, they heaped all the branches on the ground, and Wilfred tugged on the bell. Lord Woodmouse and Primrose, his daughter, opened the door. Here we are," said Mr. Apple, mopping his face. "Do you want it all inside?" "Yes, please," said Lord Woodmouse. "We'll start by decorating the stairs." Eagerly, the children pulled the branches over the polished palace floors and skidded their way into the great hall. "Are you two ready for tonight?" asked Lord Woodmouse. Primrose and Wilfred exchanged glances. That evening, after dark. All the mice would gather round a blazing fire for the traditional midwinter celebrations. A grand entertainment was planned, and Primrose and Wilfred had chosen to give a recitation. We're almost ready," said Primrose, "but we've still got to practice, and we need proper costumes." You'd better see your mother about those," replied her father. "You can practice wherever you like." Leaving Clover, Catkin, and Teasel to go back to the wood with Mr. Apple, Primrose and Wilfred took themselves off to a corner of the hall and began to go through their lines. When the days are the shortest, the nights are the coldest," began Primrose, drawing an imaginary cloak around her. Uh, uh, look out, you two!" interrupted Basil, bustling past with some bottles. "The frost is the sharpest. The year is the oldest." Continued Wilfred. Mind your tails," called Poppy, rolling in a huge green cheese. "This is hopeless," sighed Primrose. "We can't rehearse here. Let's go and ask Mamma what to do." Lady Woodmouse was busy making caraway biscuits in the kitchen. She leaned on her rolling pin to listen to Primrose's tale of woe. "Why don't you see if there's something up in the attic for you to wear?" She said, "You could practice up there too." She packed a little basket with bread and cheese and a jug of blackberry juice and shooed the children gently out of the kitchen. There were a great many attic rooms at the top of Old Oak Palace. Lady Woodmouse used them to tidy away things that might come in useful: babies' blankets and rolls of lace, boxes of buttons, stacks of books. Broken toys, patchwork quilts, pudding cloths, and old saucepans were all crammed together, higgledy piggledy, on the shelves. Primrose and Wilfred went from room to room, looking for a suitable spot for their rehearsal. They ended up in a crowded storeroom at the end of a passage, but it was difficult to concentrate on practicing. There were so many things to look at. Standing on tiptoe, Primrose reached inside the drawer of an old wooden dresser. In it, she found some bundles of letters tied up in pink ribbon, but she couldn't read the writing. And as it's rude to read other people's letters, she put them back. As she did so, she caught sight of a small key which had slipped down at the side of the drawer. Look at this, Wilfred! She cried excitedly. Let's see. Oh, it's only an old key," said Wilfred. "Is it time for lunch?" Primrose said nothing. But she slipped the key into her pinafore pocket before setting out their picnic on the floor. Do you think this would make a cloak? Said Wilfred, his mouth full of bread and cheese. He had seized the end of a long green curtain and was winding himself up in it. As he turned towards Primrose, he caught sight of a small door hidden behind its folds. Where does this go to, Primrose? He asked. 
I don't know," replied Primrose, scrambling over some boxes. "Does it open?" Wilfrid pushed. The door was locked. He peeped through the keyhole and saw another flight of stairs on the other side of the door. "It's no good," he said disappointedly. "We can't get in." If there's a keyhole, there must be a key," said Primrose, "and I think I have it here." She reached inside her pinafore pocket and handed the little key to Wilfred. He tried it in the lock; it fitted perfectly, and the door swung open. They found themselves in a dark, panelled hall at the foot of a long, winding staircase. The stair carpet must once have been beautiful, but now it was tattered and covered with dust. No one can have been up here for years and years," whispered Primrose. "Shall we see what's at the top?" Wilfred nodded. So up the stairs they went, round and round. Primrose kept close behind Wilfred. She couldn't help feeling a little nervous. Suddenly, the stairs came to an abrupt end. They were standing in yet another hall. And there ahead was yet another door, but this time it was huge and richly carved. They went up to it, and Wilfred gave it a push. As the door opened, the children stared about them in amazement. They were standing in the most magnificent room. There were columns and carvings, and dark tapestries and paintings on the walls. In front of them, two golden chairs stood on a little platform. Everything in the room was covered in dust, and the air smelled musty and strange. Where are we? asked Wilfred. I don't know, whispered Primrose. I've never been here before. They tiptoed across the floor, leaving footprints as they went. Maybe your ancestors lived here in the olden days, Primrose. Said Wilfred, gazing at an imposing portrait. Let's clean it all up and have it as our house," said Primrose. "We could keep it secret and come up here to play." As she spoke, she opened a cupboard and found it full of hats. Wilfred, look at these! They're just right for tonight. A door at the end of the room led into a nursery. There was a canopied cot near the window, and all sorts of dust-covered toys were on the shelves. Wilfred peered inside an ancient trunk and pulled out a little suit with a high jacket and tight braided trousers. It was almost the right size for him. Neatly folded beneath it were dresses and cloaks, waistcoats and shawls, some trimmed with gold and others studded with shining stones. The children held them up one after another, and each chose an outfit for the evening and tried it on. Perfect! And now we must practice. Let's finish exploring first," said Wilfred. They seemed to be in a whole suite of rooms. There was a dining room, a butler's pantry, a small kitchen, and several other bedrooms. The bathroom was particularly grand, with a tiled floor and high windows. Wilfred rubbed a mirror clean and made faces at himself, whilst Primrose leaned over the side of the bath to try the taps. No water came out. When the days are the shortest, the nights are the coldest. She recited. Her voice sounded loud and echoey. Wilfred joined in, and they went through their lines again and again until they were word perfect. Outside, the red sun was sinking low in the frosty air, and the bathroom was filled with shadows. It's getting late," said Primrose. "If we don't hurry, we'll miss the log." They picked up their clothes and scampered over the dusty floors to the door. Down the stairs they ran, round and round, down and down, till they found themselves back in the storeroom. They locked the door with the little key and replaced it in the drawer. Then they crept along the corridors to Primrose's room, taking care to keep out of sight. Primrose opened her window. They could just hear the caroling of the mice as the midwinter log was pulled along the hedge. There was no time to change, so they threw on their cloaks to hide their costumes and ran to join the crowd at the palace gates. 
Mr. Apple and Dusty Dogwood headed the procession, and they held their lanterns high to light up the way. Roast the chestnuts, heat the wine, pass the cups along the line. Gather round the log burns bright, it's warm as toast inside tonight, sang the mice as the log came into view. Teasel, Clover, and Catkin were perched on the huge branch, and as it was dragged up to the palace gates, Primrose and Wilfred scrambled up behind. The mice pulled the log carefully over the threshold, and Basil threw some bramble wine onto the bark. Merry midwinter! He called amidst cheers. At last, the log was here. The midwinter celebrations could begin. A fire had been laid ready in the hearth of the great hall, and the log was rolled onto it. Everyone was handed a cup of steaming punch. Old Mrs. Eyebright was to light the fire, and she held up a burning taper. To summer, she announced, and Mister Apple stooped to help her thrust the taper into the fire. To, to, to summer, summer, echoed the mice. The bright flames licked the mossy bark, and soon the log was ablaze. The mice helped themselves to supper, which was spread on a table near the fire, and Basil refilled their cups. Why don't you take off your cloak, dear? said Lady Woodmouse. It's very hot here by the fire. Not just yet, Mamma said Primrose. I'm still a bit chilly. When they had eaten all they could, they drew their chairs up round the hearth, and the entertainment began. Mr. Apple made huge shadows on the wall by standing in front of the fire. He made the shape of a weasel with a mean little eye and a snake's head, a fox, and with the aid of a curtain, a bat. The little mice squealed and laughed. Next, Basil played a jig on his fiddle, and Dusty did some conjuring tricks. Then they tried to pass a crab apple right round the circle, holding it under their chins. And after that. Lord Woodmouse told stirring tales of olden times. Primrose and Wilfred nudged each other. Everyone did a turn until, at last, Lord Woodmouse said, "And now, Primrose, what have you got for us?" The children jumped up and took their places in front of the fire, drawing their cloaks closely round them. They began. Midwinter. When, When the, the days are the shortest, shortest the, the nights, nights are, are the coldest, coldest, the frost is the sharpest, the year is the oldest, the sun is the weakest, the wind is the hardest, the snow is the deepest, the skies are the darkest. So polish your whiskers and tidy your nest, and dress in your richest and finest and best, for winter has brought you the worst it can bring, and now it will give you the promise of spring. Primrose and Wilfred threw off their cloaks and donned their hats with a flourish. The audience gasped to see the beautiful clothes which sparkled in the firelight, and then clapped and cheered louder than ever. The applause went on for so long that Lord Woodmouse had to ask them to do it all over again. At last, Primrose and Wilfred went back to their seats. That was wonderful," whispered Lady Woodmouse, hugging her. Wherever did you find those beautiful clothes? Primrose glanced quickly at Wilfred. In the attic, she mumbled, hoping that her mother wouldn't ask any more awkward questions. Luckily, at that moment, Basil started to tell one last story, and everyone settled down to listen. Primrose and Wilfred gazed at the fire and thought of all the lovely games they would play in their house at the top of the secret staircase. Soon, their heads began to nod. And in no time at all, they were both fast asleep.